This morning, we're going to look at some lessons from the reign of King Josiah. Some of you might be wondering, why? Who is that? What can we possibly learn from this king who lived and reigned over 2,600 years ago from this portion of scripture in this obscure book called 2 Chronicles? What does this story have to offer us here in Kitchener-Waterloo in 2020? We find ourselves in a different culture. We find ourselves in a different political situation. What does this story have to offer us? And I would argue, and hopefully we'll see, that there's a lot for us to learn and apply from this passage. Because although we may live in a different time and place in salvation history, the larger context in which we find ourselves is actually very similar to that of King Josiah's. As early as three generations before King Josiah reigned, the people of God enjoyed a time of blessing, of spiritual prosperity in the land of Judah. The nation worshipped the Lord. They would celebrate Passover together in accordance with God's law on a yearly basis under the reign of a godly king named King Hezekiah. King Hezekiah was a godly leader and he did what was right and good and true and faithful in the eyes of God. And so as a result, the people in his kingdom flourished and they followed hard after the Lord. They observed God's law and they sought to live in obedience to his commands. That was King Hezekiah. But just three generations later, by the time King Josiah is king, all that has changed. The word of God has literally been lost in the land. This means it obviously no longer held a place of centrality and prominence in the land. It was no longer observed and adhered to. The people had turned away from the one true God as a result and worshipped idols, bowed down to figures made of wood and stone. And as a result of all of this, sin had run rampant in the land. There no longer remained a fear of the Lord. The leaders of the land were corrupt and ungodly. The Bible says that the last leader incurred guilt more and more in the eyes of God. The nation was in need of revival and of restoration. All that to say, I think we kind of find ourselves in a similar situation, do we not? We live in a nation and in a province that at one time, only a few generations ago, for the most part, worshipped the Lord. It was predominantly Christian. The word of God was respected. The law of God, in kind of a general sense, was upheld. There was a fear of the Lord across this land. It wouldn't be unusual for most people to go to church on Sunday morning. But here we are, just a few generations later, and all that has changed. Here in Ontario in 2020, it seems like the word of God has been all but lost. Not just in places outside of the church, but I would argue in many of our churches as well. The word of God has been lost. I've talked to many of you and you've told me that it took so long to just find a church that preached the word. And that's sad. I don't know what, preaches are, uh, what churches are doing if they're not preaching God's word. And so as a result... We shouldn't be surprised that if God's word is lost in many of the churches, that it would be lost in our nation as a whole. And so this has led to a turning away from God and from his word, and sin is running rampant. It's getting worse by the day, it seems. It's increasing exponentially in our culture. As I was preparing for this sermon on Friday, I took a, a short break and logged on to Twitter to see what was new in the world, and I saw a tweet from Sesame Street. Right, probably one of the most innocent shows that's been on television over the last 50 years. But the tweet was boasting about how in their next season, in one of their upcoming episodes, they will feature an LGBT activist drag queen on it to speak to the children that watch the program. And the tweet included pictures of a man in a dress hanging out with Elmo and some of the other characters on the show. Sesame Street's not even safe anymore. We live in a dark time. In just a few generations, we've gotten to this place. And so all that to say, the context in which we find ourselves is not very different than the context in which King Josiah found himself. And so we can learn some lessons from his reign that hopefully we can apply to our lives and to our church. So let me, let me read 2 Chronicles 34. I'm going to read this whole chapter. It's rather long. But as we'll see in this passage, the reading of God's word is powerful. And so uh, this is the word of the Lord. Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem, and he did what was right in the eyes of the Lord 
and walked in the ways of David his father, and he did not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. For in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David his father. And in the twelfth year, he began to purge Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the ashram and the carved and the metal images. And he chopped down the altars of the Baals in his presence, and he cut down the incense altars that stood above them. And he broke in pieces the ashram and the carved and the metal images. And he made dust of them and scattered it over the graves of those who had sacrificed to them. He also burned the bones of the priests on their altars and cleansed Judah and Jerusalem. And in the cities of Manasseh, of Ephraim, and Simeon, and as far as Naphtali, in their ruins all around, he broke down the altars and beat the ashram and the images into powder and cut down all the incense altars throughout all the land of Israel. Then he returned to Jerusalem. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had cleansed the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, and Maaseah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord his God. They came to Hilkiah, the high priest, and gave him the money that had been brought into the house of God, which the Levites, the keepers of the threshold, had collected from Manasseh and Ephraim, and from all the remnant of Israel, and from all Judea and Benjamin, and from the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they gave it to the workmen who were working in the house of the Lord, and the workmen who were working in the house of the Lord gave it for repairing and restoring the house. They gave it to the carpenters and the builders to buy quarried stone and timber for binders and beams for the buildings that the kings of Judah had let go to ruin. And the men did the work faithfully. Over them were set Jahath and Obadiah, uh, the Levites, the sons of Merari, and Zechariah and Meshullam of the sons of the Kohathites to have oversight. The Levites, all who were skilled with instruments of music, were over the burden bearers and directed all who did work in every kind of service, and some of the Levites were scribes and officials and gatekeepers. While they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. Shaphan brought the book to the king and further reported to the king, all, all that was committed to your servants they are doing. They have emptied out the money that was found in the house of the Lord and have given it into the hand of the overseers and the workmen. Then Shaphan, the secretary, told the king, Hilkiah, the priest, has given me a book. And Shaphan read from it before the king. And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah, Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, Abdon, the son of Micah, Shaphan, the secretary, and Aziah, the king's servant, saying, Go, inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us because our fathers have not kept the word of the Lord to do according to all that is written in this book. So Hilkiah and those whom the king had sent went to Huldah the prophetess, the wife of Shalom, the son of Tokhath, son of Hazra, keeper of the wardrobe. Now she lived in Jerusalem in the second quarter and spoke to her to that effect. And she said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Tell the man who sent you to me, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will bring disaster upon this place and upon its inhabitants, all the curses that are written in the book that was read before the king of Judah, because they have forsaken me and have made offerings to other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and its inhabitants, and you have humbled yourself before me and have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Behold, I will gather you to your fathers, and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place and its inhabitants. And they brought back word to the king. Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and the priests and the Levites, all the people, both great and small. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul. 
to perform the words of the covenant that were written in his book, in this book. Then he made all who were present in Jerusalem and in Benjamin join in it. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem did according to the covenant of God, the God of their fathers. And Josiah took away all the abominations from all the territory that belonged to the people of Israel and made all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not turn away from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would bless the reading and preaching of your word this morning. Pray that you would give me unction, that you would anoint my lips, and pray, Lord, that you would open all of our ears and all of our hearts to receive your word uh, with delight this morning, that sinners would be saved and that saints would be sanctified as a result of the preached word, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I've given you some of the general context of this chapter, but let me give you a little bit more of the details. As we saw, Josiah is a king in the land of Judah. And so at this point in salvation history, the people of God have been divided into two kingdoms. The 12 tribes of Israel have been divided into two kingdoms. We have the northern kingdom of Israel, the southern kingdom of Judah. But at this point, the northern kingdom of Israel had already been judged. God sent the Assyrians in to take over, to lead some of them into exile. And now they occupied the northern territories. But by the time of Josiah, the Assyrian power is starting to weaken. And so Josiah is even to rid some of Israel of its idolatry. Josiah's grandfather was King Manasseh. He was a king in Judah for 55 years, and this guy, let's just say, was a train wreck of a king. He rejected God's word, and he worshipped idols. He set up altars to Baal and to false gods in the temple and all throughout the land. He was so wicked that he even burned several of his sons alive in sacrifice uh, to these false gods. After Manasseh came his son, Amon. And Amon walked in the way of his father. The Bible says that he incurred guilt more and more. So it just snowballed. It snowballed. As a result, sin continued to flourish in the land. And idolatry was everywhere. And so after two years as king, just two years, Amon was assassinated by his own people. And then the people decide to make Josiah king at eight years old. Okay? So we've had two evil kings. We've had two evil kings. The last king was assassinated. The people are following idols and want nothing to do with God. They've witnessed the northern kingdom of Israel experience God's judgment and be led into exile. And now in the middle of all of this, we have this young boy who becomes king. And by the way, the word of God had been lost uh, over the last few generations. And so for the sermon today, I want to focus more so on verses 8 to 33, but before I do that, I want to make a few comments on the introductory verses in verses 1 to 7. Notice in verse 2, it says that Josiah did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, and he walked in the ways of David, his father. He walked in the ways of David, his father. We see something here about the power of one's legacy. King Josiah, he didn't have access to a copy of God's word like we do to read about how David was king. He didn't have access to the law to teach him about how to live a righteous life. But he likely heard stories about David's faithfulness to God and his exemplary kingship. He learned how to be a good king from his great, 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 great grandfather, David. This tells us that your faithfulness to God in this generation could have a ripple effect in centuries to come. Your faithfulness to God in this life could have an effect on your great, 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 great grandson. And so steward it well. Another interesting point to make is that while it, it does say of other kings like Hezekiah and Joash that they walked in the ways of David, his father, of no one else, of no other king, does it say that he did not turn aside from the right hand or to the left. That's only said of King Josiah. So he's a very exemplary king, a very upright and godly man. Verse 3 says that in the eighth year of his reign, while he was yet a boy, he began to seek the God of David, his father. I think there's a good lesson here for young people, for youth, for children, that the time is now to seek the Lord. Don't put it off and think, oh, maybe I'll do that when I'm an adult. Maybe I'll seek after the Lord and I'll try and live in obedience to him. I'm a teenager now. I'm just going to enjoy my life. I'll take care of that when I'm an adult. No, don't put it off. Do it now. It says, while he was yet a boy, it makes a point of saying that, he began to seek after the Lord. And notice that this process of seeking is a very long process. 
So he begins seeking the Lord at about 16. It was not until four years later that he decided to cleanse the temple and the land of all the pagan worship and all the idolatry. And then it was not until six years after that that he found a copy of God's word, was convicted of sin, and repented. This tells us sometimes when we seek the Lord for something, maybe it's salvation or repentance, maybe it's victory over sin, maybe it's an answer to prayer, maybe it has something to do with our growth in Christ, whatever it is we're seeking the Lord for, sometimes we may have to do it for years before God will show up and answer our prayer and respond to our seeking after him. It's to be ongoing. We don't just seek him once, and if he doesn't answer, then that's it. It's ongoing. It took Josiah 10 years before he found a copy of God's word and repented. There's a lesson in that for us. All right, now with that out of the way, let's focus in on the narrative in verses 8 to 33. And as we do that, I'm going to organize this sermon into five points, five lessons, five things that we observe in this story. And here's the first thing that we'll look at together. Number one, we see the power of God's word. We see the power of God's word. This entire chapter, this entire narrative, it's all ordered and centered around the rediscovery of God's word during the uh, temple repair. The discovery of God's word is kind of the turning point in this whole chapter. Everything that follows is a result of the discovery of God's word. Josiah repenting, the people serving the Lord again, that's all a result of discovering God's word. In other words, if God's word was not recovered in the temple, if it was not read to Josiah, then these things would have never happened. So let's look at verse 8 again. Now in the 18th year of his reign, when he had cleansed the land and the house, he sent Shaphan, the son of Azaliah, And Maaseah, the governor of the city, and Joah, the son of Joahaz, the recorder, to repair the house of the Lord, his God. And so he's cleansed the land of idolatry. He's cleansed the temple. And now Josiah has decided it's time to repair the temple. It's time to repair the house of the Lord. And so he commissions this renovation project. And he sends these men by the name of Shaphan, Maaseah, and Joah to oversee uh, this temple repair project. In verse 9, we see that there's a collection done throughout the land of Judah to pay for the repairs of the temple. And they bring the money to the high priest who gives it to the workmen, and they steward the money for the temple repairs. Interestingly, though, in these verses, we see there are all kinds of different people that take part in this repair project. So Shaphan, we see later, is a secretary. Maaseah is the governor of the city. Uh, Joah is a recorder. In verses 11, it speaks of carpenters, it speaks of builders and workmen. In verses 12, it speaks of Levites, musicians. In in verse 13, it mentions burden bearers and scribes and officials and gatekeepers. All that to say, all these people had many different skill sets. They had different jobs, different roles, different abilities, and yet they all came together to contribute to this project of repairing the temple. It's a wonderful picture of the unity of God's people coming together for this common purpose. And certainly, I think there's some parallels here with the current renovation project that we're undergoing as a church. We've seen so many different people in our church come together to contribute to this project, and it's a picture of unity. It's something that pleases the Lord. So I tried to think about different kinds of people that have been helping with this. We've had carpenters and plumbers and painters and contractors and engineers and lawyers and accountants, businessmen, pilots, mechanics, farmers, and many more, all from within this church helping to contribute to this project. We've even had youth come that help with their dads on the weekends or that have come uh, for special occasions where we've had to move different things around the new building. It's a wonderful picture of the unity of God's people. I think God's using this to grow us in unity. And to put the beauty of the gospel on display in this small way. Here's a quote from Matthew Henry's commentary that I think is is helpful. He's commenting on these verses, verses 10 to 13, and he writes this. It's a good word for us in the middle of this project. He says, Let not the overseers of the work despise the bearers of burdens, nor let those that work in the service grudge at those whose office it is to direct, but let each esteem and serve the other in love. And let God have the glory and the church the benefit of the gifts and dispositions of both. I believe that's what we've seen so far with the renovations that are ongoing at Lobsinger Line. We've seen people serving in love and doing it for the glory of God and ultimately the benefit of the church as well. Look at what it says in verse 12. I like this statement. It says, And the men did the work faithfully. 
I think it's so cool that God decided to include that line in Scripture. He makes note that the men who worked on the temple repairs did the work faithfully. He chose to acknowledge and commend the hard work of these men in renovating the temple. He cared enough to include the statement in Holy Scripture forevermore. So again, I think there's some application here for our building team and for the volunteers that have put in so much effort into the renovations. Your faithful hard work is pleasing to God. It brings him glory as you do the work faithfully. And so yesterday, I went to the building just before 8 to work on this sermon. And sure enough, there were already guys there from our church hard at work, giving up their Saturday uh, to, to put in work to get these renovations going and to continue them. And then I left later in the afternoon, and they were still there, hard at work, doing the work faithfully. This is pleasing to the Lord. And so to all of those that have taken part in this and that are helping, know that your labor is not in vain. Thank you for your hard work, and know that God is well pleased with it. He cares about it. He includes this line in Scripture. The men did the work faithfully. All right, let's move on to verses 14 to 15. While the temple renovations are ongoing, this is what we see. While they were bringing out the money that had been brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah the priest found the book of the law of the Lord given through Moses. Then Hilkiah answered and said to Shaphan the secretary, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan. So during the repairs, Hilkiah the high priest finds the book of the law. And he gives it to Shaphan. And it, it seems to indicate in, this, in these verses and really in this chapter that the law of God had been lost. This was the first time Josiah had heard from the law of God and that the high priest had come in contact with the law of God. Perhaps the kings that came before Josiah tried to burn all of the scrolls, all of the copies of God's word, and someone hid a scroll in the temple and finally it was found again. The word of God was rediscovered. And the interesting thing to me is that the temple was cleansed six years ago of idol worship. And so presumably over the last six years, the people of God would have tried to worship the Lord or um, uh, Josiah at least was seeking after the Lord uh, in the temple. But for six years, they didn't have a copy of God's word. And so the question is, what on earth was happening during corporate worship in the temple if they didn't have a copy of God's word until this point? And I would say, well, perhaps it's not very different from what goes on in many churches across this land today. And perhaps someone got up and told some stories and told some jokes, maybe gave a few life lessons, but God's word was not proclaimed. It was not read from. And people left each worship service and maybe they felt warm and fuzzy inside, but there was no repentance. There was no life change. There was no salvation. There was no heart transformation. This is how bad things were. God's law was not only disregarded, it was unknown, it was lost up until this point. And so it's no wonder that sin is running rampant and that Josiah had to go everywhere and cleanse the land of all these idols. Where God's word is not read or proclaimed or even known, there will be sin. Okay, just plain and simple. If God's word is the power to fight sin and to convict the sinner, that means that where God's word is unknown, sin will run rampant because there'll be no conviction and there'll be no repentance. And it will spiral and snowball. Verses 16 to 17, Shaphan updates King Josiah on how the repairs are going and on some of the instructions he'd been given. And then in verse 18, he mentions that Hilkiah had found a book. And at the end of verse 18, it says this, and Shaphan read from it before the king. Now look at Josiah's response, verse 19. And when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. Now this is symbolic of repentance. And the amazing thing to me is all Shaphan did was read the word. It doesn't say he preached it or explained it or exposited it. He just read it. And Josiah's conviction is instant and he repents. He's convicted. I think there are some lessons to be learned from this. Maybe it's obvious, but I think it's worth saying, especially given the midst of the project that we find ourselves in, it was not the newly renovated temple that caused Josiah to repent and the people of Judah to turn back to the Lord in worship. It was the reading and proclamation of God's word. 
And so the renovation project at Lobzinger Line, it's exciting, right? We're all excited about it. That's good. We're excited about what it represents for corporate worship on Sundays and for the school we want to start in September and for church planting. But we mustn't ever forget or lose sight of the fact that the main ministry of the church will always be the ministry of the word. It's the discipleship of God's people through the preaching and through the teaching of God's truth. Repentance and revival will not happen in people's lives and in this nation apart from the proclamation of God's word. It will not. As I said earlier, here in the 21st century in Canada, we find ourselves in a similar situation in which Judah did. The word of God may not literally be lost. In fact, maybe it's the opposite. We have so much access to the word of God. But I believe in many ways, in many places, the word of God is functionally lost. And that's why our culture is spiraling out of control. Because God's word is disregarded. It's unknown by the masses. And I'm not just talking about the world. I think this is true of many churches and many Christians. So many Christians don't know their Bibles. They're biblically illiterate because they don't read them. And yet, as I said, I think we have more access to God's word than any previous generation that has gone before us. Many of you have several hard copy Bibles at home sitting on your desk or on a bookshelf. Many of us have several Bible apps on our phone. We have more access to God's word than any generation that's come before us. So the question for you this morning is this, are you reading it? Are you spending time in God's word each and every day? Are you using it to bring about repentance in your life and to fight sin? Are you using it to grow in your walk with the Lord? How about this one? Do you prioritize Sunday worship so that you can hear God's word preached and read and sung? Or is the Bible lost in your life like it was in Judah? Does it have no bearing on your life? We have exponentially more access to God's word than any generation that has come before us. And guess what? We'll be held to account for how we stewarded that opportunity, that reality. God's word is power. We see that in this text. It's the power to convict. It's the power to save. It's the power to fight sin. It's the power to bring about restoration and revival in people's lives. The Bible says God's words are daily bread. It's his truth. And so as his people, we must read it and feed on it and know it. And then more than that, we must do what it says. We must respond to it. And that brings me to lesson number two, the urgency of repentance. Number one, the power of God's word. Number two, the, we see the urgency of repentance. Notice King Josiah repents immediately upon hearing the words of the law read. It says, and when the king, at, the, at, at that very moment, when the king heard the words of the law, he tore his clothes. Okay, there was no delay. He didn't put it off. He didn't wait for some other time. He experienced conviction of sin, and instead of suppressing that, he responded to it immediately. He humbles himself. He repents. He even weeps because he's so grieved over his sin and the sin of his people. It says in verse 27, because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard the word against this place and its inhabitants, you humbled yourself before me. You've torn your clothes and wept before me. I also have heard you. So the law is simply read. The King Josiah is humbled and repents. And I believe we have some things to learn from this. First, we see there's great usefulness in the reading and preaching of God's law. Some people think that God's law no longer has a role to play in the life of a Christian or a New Testament church because Christ has come to fulfill the law and so the law must no longer have a role to play in our lives. Well, this is simply not true. The law still has several functions, one of which, perhaps the most important being, that it reveals to us that we are unworthy sinners who fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3 verse 20 says, through the law comes knowledge of sin. In other words, if we didn't have the law, we wouldn't have knowledge of our own sin. When God's law is preached, sinners are convicted and they're shown how they fall short of God's standard for them and how they need a savior. And this is exactly what happens with King Josiah. The book of the law is read. Josiah contemplates how he's fallen short. He repents. We see there's usefulness in the reading and preaching of God's law. Second, we see that the call to repentance is urgent. It's urgent. Josiah is confronted with the law of God, and what does he do? He repents immediately. 
And there are some of you in this room that you come here each and every week and you're encouraged every single week to turn from your sin and put your faith in Jesus and repentance and faith, but you've still not done that. If that's you, may today be different. May today be a day of salvation. Stop putting it off. There's an urgency to this message. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. We've been reminded of this over the past week, have we not, with certain news headlines that serve as parables, as lessons that teach us about the fragility of life. A week ago, you have NBA star Kobe Bryant and his young daughter and seven others dying suddenly in a helicopter crash. One day he was alive and doing well and everything was going well for him and the next day he was dead and those eight others as well. Every day we're hearing about the spread of the coronavirus and I don't think it's an imminent threat to us here but certainly it has something to say to us about the fragility of our lives. You're not guaranteed tomorrow. You don't know when your number will be called. And so why would you wait to repent? Seek the Lord while he still may be found. The Bible says, humble yourself like King Josiah does in this passage. One commentator said that humbling yourself involves a change of heart and attitude from a posture of defiance toward God to submission toward God and his principles of righteousness. So humbling yourself involves going from a disposition of being against God to being for God. A disposition of being in defiance to him to now submitting to him. I think that's a good definition. But I think humbling yourself also involves recognizing that you deserve nothing but the wrath of God. You and I, we deserve nothing but for God's wrath to be poured out on us. Josiah comes to this realization. Look at verse 21. He says, Go inquire of the Lord for me and for those who are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that has been found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out on us. Because you and I have not fully kept God's word, the word of the Lord, we deserve nothing but the wrath of God. And yet we know that Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, decided to take God's wrath on himself in our place on the cross. Even though we deserve to have all the curses come down on us that are uh, written about in God's law, Jesus Christ became a curse so that we wouldn't have to. As he hung there on the cross and then he rose again and he commands us to repent of our sin and to follow him. So again, if you've not done that, do it today because you don't know if you'll have tomorrow. You don't know if you'll have tomorrow. And that brings me to the next lesson that we see in this passage, number three, the grace of salvation. We see the grace of salvation. After Josiah tears his clothes in repentance, He asks Hilkiah and several others to go inquire of the Lord for him. And they go to this prophetess named Huldah. This is the only place in scripture where Huldah is mentioned. There were other prophets that were prophesying at this time, such as Jeremiah or Nahum or Zephaniah. Uh, But they go to this prophet named Huldah. And in verses 23 to 26, she prophesies of God's coming judgment, that it's inevitable, that God's wrath will be poured on them, it will be unquenchable. Disaster and the curses of the law will come upon his people. But then we get to verse 26. And verse 26 starts with that wonderful word, but. In so many places in scripture where that word, but, shows up, you know that mercy and grace will follow it. And that's what happens here. Josiah has just heard the words of condemnation and judgment Put yourself in his shoes. Imagine what he must have been thinking. The last statement in verse 25 is that, therefore my wrath will be poured out on this place and will not be quenched. So Josiah's felt conviction. He knows he deserves God's wrath. He's heard that the unquenchable wrath of God's about to be poured out on him. And then he hears these words in verse 26. But to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, regarding the words that you have heard, Because your heart was tender and you humbled yourself before God when you heard his words against this place and its inhabitants, and you have humbled yourself before me and have torn your clothes and wept before me, I also have heard you, declares the Lord. Behold, I will gather you to your fathers and you shall be gathered to your grave in peace and your eyes shall not see all the disaster that I will bring upon this place and its inhabitants. And they brought back word to the king. 
Man, what relief this must have brought to Josiah's heart when he heard these words. That God promised to spare Josiah from the coming disaster and judgment. And that he would go to his grave in peace. In the midst of this pronouncement of judgment, we see the grace of salvation. We see that those who truly humble themselves and repent of their sins will escape the wrath of God. But we also see that those who don't will experience the wrath of God and the disaster that comes with it. And the Bible says that his wrath will not be quenched. This means those who do not humble themselves and repent and trust in Jesus will suffer under God's wrath forevermore. They will never be quenched. And so if you're here this morning and you want to escape God's judgment, then you need to repent of your sins. Do it. Humble yourself. Grieve over your sin like Josiah does and then flee to Jesus Christ. He is the only way to be saved and to escape God's wrath. After Josiah repents, after he's promised salvation from God, the next thing that we see is this, number four, the commitment to obedience. We see a commitment to obedience, and there's a progression here in these points, right? It's a natural progression. We, God's word is unleashed. It's read. Josiah hears it. He's convicted of his sin, so he repents immediately. He receives the grace of salvation, and now in response to this wonderful mercy that he's received from God, he commits to living a life of obedience to him. There's a progression here. So let me read verses 29 to 30 again to you. Then the king sent and gathered together all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem. And the king went up to the house of the Lord with all the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites, all the people, both great and small. Gathers everyone together. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. And the king stood in his place and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of the covenant that were written in this book. Josiah makes a covenant after receiving uh, this promise of salvation, a covenant to obey the Lord. But notice the first thing he does is he gathers together all the people and he reads God's word to them. So he's just experienced mercy and salvation. He's just come in contact with the word. He's excited about it. And so what does he do? He shares it with whoever he could. This is a natural response of someone who's experienced the forgiveness of sins. They should want to share it with others so that they could, too can turn to the Lord and be saved and live in obedience to him. And so he does that. And then in verse 31, he makes a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes and to do so with all his heart and soul. He does that first. He's leading by example here. He's making a public commitment, a public statement to follow the Lord. That he's repented, he trusts in the Lord now, and he's going to follow him for the rest of his life. And you have to remember, these are the same people that killed his dad two years into their reign. Some of these people are not reasonable people, but Josiah doesn't care. He's not afraid of what they might think. He's not ashamed of his faith. And then in verse 32, he makes all of the people join in on the covenant. So what do we learn from this part of the story? Well, first of all, we learn that we've, if we've been saved by the grace of God, there should be a desire within us to live in obedience to him. The person who's truly been forgiven of their sin is the person who then desires to sin no more. If someone calls you to follow Christ and repent, they're also calling you to then pursue a life of holiness and righteousness in him. You can't have one without the other. It's a call to observe all that he has commanded us in his word. The example of King Josiah shows us that salvation has to lead to sanctification. And so if there's no desire in your heart to pursue obedience in Christ, if there's no growth in godliness in your life, if there's no repentance over indwelling sin, if there's no victory over sin in your life, then you have much reason to doubt your salvation. Because those who truly love Christ will seek to obey him. That's why Jesus says numerous times, if you love me, then you will obey my commandments. And this is exactly what Josiah vows to do. And consider, again, how Josiah does this publicly. He publicly declares his faith in God and his desire to follow him. To me, I believe there are some parallels here for baptism, are there not? 
His baptism is to be a public declaration of faith that you believe in Jesus and you want to follow him for the rest of your life. He saved you and so now you want to live in obedience to him. The act of baptism itself is supposed to be the first step of obedience. And so all that to say, if you profess faith in Christ but you're unwilling to be baptized, what does that say about your faith in him? I think that's a serious problem. Could even be evidence that you're not truly saved. Because if you're truly saved, then you should have no problem publicly declaring your love for Jesus as Josiah does here. Your desire for obedience should far outweigh your fear of man. And who cares what other people think? God has saved you. You've been spared from God's wrath. The least you could do is get up on this stage and say, I'm with Jesus now, and then be dunked. And Josiah shows that our, our, our desire for obedience should outweigh our fear of man. I think there's some application here for small group involvement and church membership as well. King Josiah doesn't want to pursue obedience to God alone. He wanted to do so alongside of the people, alongside of God's people. And so he makes them take part in this covenant that he's renewing with God. As Christians, there should be a desire within us to pursue holiness together, alongside of other believers. We should not just desire for our own growth, but we should have a desire for the growth of other brothers and sisters here as well. This is why in both small group and when you become a member of the church, you make a covenant with one another. You make a covenant to watch over one another, to live at peace with one another, and encourage one another, and bear one another's burdens, and to help each other seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Because we believe we cannot pursue obedience to Christ in isolation. We need each other. We need to do it in community. And this is certainly what King Josiah desired. And so he makes this commitment to obedience, and he does so publicly and alongside of God's people. And so let's recap before we get to the final point. So far we've seen in this story, we've seen the power of God's word, we've seen the urgency of repentance, the grace of salvation, and the commitment to obedience. And finally, here's the final point, and really this is kind of the conclusion to this sermon. Number five, we see the need for a better king. We see the need for a better king. As good as Josiah was, he wasn't good enough. Look at verse 33. It says, And Josiah took away all the abominations from all the territory that belonged to the people of Israel and made all who were present in Israel serve the Lord their God. All his days they did not turn away from following the Lord, the God of their fathers. Now the statement that struck me in particular in that verse was when it says that Josiah made all who were present in Israel serve the God of their fathers. How can someone make someone else serve the Lord? Well, I think what's happening here is that King Josiah is using his authority as king to enforce God's law and to make the people live in observance of it, make the people live in obedience to God's law. But the question is, were their hearts truly changed? Was their obedience to God genuine and heartfelt, or was it simply outward obedience and conformity to a new law? Were they truly following the Lord, not just because the king commanded it, but because they had a change of heart? And unfortunately, we'll see in Scripture, the answer is no. The answer is no. King Josiah reigned for 31 years, and then he died like every other king that came before him. And immediately after his death, Judah falls back into idolatry, falls back into sin, and does what is evil in the sight of the Lord. And so soon after Josiah's uh, death, God sends Babylon in to capture Jerusalem and to burn and destroy the temple and to bring God's people into exile. This was an act of judgment. This is what is talked about in that prophecy that we read. King Josiah may have been able to enforce a law, but he could not change the human heart. He may have been able to turn away God's wrath for a season, but he couldn't turn God's wrath away forever. And so listen I want you to listen now to Jeremiah's commentary on the people of Judah during the reign of King Josiah. Jeremiah prophesied during this time. Listen to what he says in chapter 3, Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 6 to 10. He says this, The Lord said to me in the days of King Josiah, Have you seen what she did, that faithless one Israel? Remember, you have the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah. Have you seen what she did, that faithless one Israel, how she went up on every high hill and under every green tree and there played the whore? And I thought, after she has done this, she will return to me. But she did not return. 
and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. She saw that for all the adulteries of that faithless one Israel, I had sent her away with a decree of divorce. Yet her treacherous sister Judah did not fear, but she too went and played the whore. Because she took her whoredom lightly, she polluted the land, committing adultery with stone and tree, with idols. Yet for all this, notice, for all this, her treacherous sister Judah did not return to me with her whole heart, but only in pretense, declares the Lord. Judah did not return to the Lord with their whole heart, just in pretense. What does that mean? That means that their obedience under King Josiah was superficial at best. It was insincere. It was just an outward obedience. Their hearts hadn't changed. And so as good of a king as King Josiah was, he did not turn from the left or to the right. Ultimately, God's people needed a better king. God's people needed a king who could not only cleanse their temple, but one who could cleanse their hearts. He needed a king who could not only turn away God's wrath for a season, but turn away God's wrath for eternity. And of course, we know and we believe that Jesus is that better king. King Josiah tore his clothes when he heard the curses of the law read. But King Jesus, his flesh was torn when he became a curse for us and bore those curses. Death was able to put an end to King Josiah's reign and then his people declined. But it could not do so with the reign of Christ. Jesus Christ is the only king who lived and died but then rose again. He defeated sin and death once and for all. He did what Josiah could not do. Jesus Christ is the only king who can take a heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh such that we don't just outwardly obey God because someone tells us to, but we outwardly obey God because we want to obey him in our hearts. Our hearts have been regenerated and only King Jesus can do this. So Jesus is the better king. Jesus is the greater Josiah. And Jesus is seated on his throne right now. And he continues to reign. He is sovereign over you. He is sovereign over me. And there will never come an end to his reign, for he shall reign forevermore. 